Hello, this is Dr. Scott Young, and here's what we're going to talk about today. We're doing the fifth of our series of Truth and Lies in What We Believe, and it's Death Before Creation. Coming right up. Okay, so when you have an issue about the Bible, I want you to think about it from how Satan looks at it versus how God looks at this thing. See, I started as a vocal performance major and then I moved into English. Now, I want you to think about if you are a book reader. I'm not talking about just someone who reads book, books, but you actually are approving it for publishers. And there's plenty of people like this. So one of the things, if you were trying to prove a, if someone was trying to prove a theory, you were trying to read it. If you, in the very beginning of the book, blow up the theory, then do you have to read the rest of it? The answer is no. Here's what, I want you to think about Satan as the person who has been looking at the Bible, 66 books with 40 different authors, and what he's doing is trying to beat up everything about it. So he is the great book critic, in essence. So when we talk about death before creation, I want you to see in this, this next slide right here, there are different theories about this. And so here's what, what Satan actually did. He goes, you know what? I'm going to beat up the beginning part of the book because then they're going to be wondering if the theories are correct. I'm also going to attack the death and resurrection of Jesus because if you do that, it doesn't really matter anything about Jesus being God. I'm also going to fix the end of the book in Revelation, and that's my Hope in the Last Day series. See, if you do all these things, you don't have to deal with Daniel. You don't have to deal with Ezekiel. They could just be great stories, okay? David and Goliath, no big deal. Whatever you want to believe about those things, that's fine. They're fairy tales. But if you see what Satan's trying to do by attacking three major areas, that's a problem. Now, there are people who do an amazing job. The Creation Institute, and create, uh, uh, creationtoday.org is an awesome one. And there's a friend of mine named Jeff Swanson that has um, beginning in Genesis and ending in Revelation. Beginning of Genesis. There are th those three different areas. And you can see them at planbible.com with Jeff Swanson Ministries or creationtoday.org or the Creation Institute, it's actually near Cincinnati. Those are amazing resources for you. But what I really want to do when we're talking about this is not go into some of those points of depth that, you know, there, there are scientific looks. That's fine. What I want to look at when we're talking about this is some of the basic ideas so that you can share this with your friends. Okay, so the basic points are the evolutionary theories versus the Bible's language. In evolution, we're talking about billions of years. Every time I say that, I always think of Carl saying billions and billions of years. And what we're, they want to look at as a billions of year idea. It's scientifically proven, and it's clinically accurate with fossil and carbon-14 dating, or pick the, pick the different dating mechanism, to prove the age of the Earth. And so that's what they step on. Okay, and one of the things that they will say is that the strata layers are consistent with all the aging mechanism. So then they, they cross transpose those things in. So this thing is that age because we know it's 100 million years. Therefore, if it's at this age, it is 100 million years. Well, wait a second, why? And they, they have problems with that. Now, the creation theory has Wild is a wildly controversial theory. It cannot prove the points of any of that. That's, that's a real issue that, that comes out to people. It's based upon a text that claims to be ancient without, sometimes people will say, without verification. Now, we do know that it's verified in several ways. And the story is based upon a version that feels fictional. So these are the problems that, that people face when they look at this. 
Let's talk a little bit about the gap theory. And um, the gap theory is Genesis 1-1, God created the heavens and the earth, okay? In the beginning, God created. We'll just stop there. Then it moves into uh, the, uh, the, uh, the covering of the waters. And there's this really interesting theory. When I was, I had grown up with evolution that I just thought it was right. But then when I would read about the Bible, I was looking at it and saying, how do I match up what the Bible is saying with evolution? So some people will go to the gap theory. And, and again, where the gap theory is, is trying to say that there's, there was a whole big time frame of the billions of years so that we get millions and billions of years, and then the creation story goes on about 6,000 years ago. And some people think it's not a problem. There was a church here in town in the Tulsa area here who taught it all the time. I went to the pastor and actually his son at the time, and we had a really good conversation. But then I didn't realize that about a year or two later, after I left that conversation, and I was frustrated with this church because they were teaching a theory that it was a theory. And they were trying to say, you know, what it was doing is breaking down the Bible. And, and he was beating me up left and right in this, this uh, talk. He said, this guy came in and talked to me. And, and again, he wasn't saying my name, and I'm not going to say his name because it's not really about that, okay? But what, what the problem is, is if we have to insert something into the text, we have problems. There was another creation or sort of evolution, sort of semi-creation group that said that the Bible up to, from Genesis 1 to Genesis 11 is absolutely debatable, but after Genesis 11, it's all scientific. It's because they struggle with those ideas that are in there about the 6,000 years. There's another book uh, called uh, The Four Blood Moons. And in that, in that uh, conversation, he, he set up how the Bible is true. I mean, this is like five or six, 10 pages, whatever, about how the Bible's true, the Bible's true, the Bible's true, the Bible's verified. Then he said, literally, if your kids come home and tell you about millions of years, don't worry about that because that's true. Dude. Well, how do you get to say that? And he had no answers for that. It's because most Christians struggle with this idea because they see all the scientific evidence, but they, but they don't realize it's not evidence. It's a theory point. Because if you have a gap of billions of years, and we're going to show you a little bit about this issue of the gap of billions of years. If you have billions of years and you get, to, you get to skip inside of those texts, I'm going to throw out something that most people don't want to go into. You go to the very end of the Bible. Go to Revelation 22. Revelation 22 says, those who read this book, if they take anything out of it, I'm going to take away from you the tree of life, which is basically eternal life. If you add anything to this text, I'm going to add the plagues that are written within this. I'm like, I don't want that. I don't want to add. I don't want to subtract. I don't want to do any of that. And that's why our job as Christians is to like look at the scriptures. Now, some people say that we just disengage our minds. Let's show you how we don't. So on our next slide here, the earth is cursed before death and what's the problem? So when you look at this kind of thing, death, is we see this kind of, this point all the way around. So God creates the perfection of everything. Then there's death, then he creates it again. You go, wait a second, if he created it perfect, then we have death. How can you have death before sin? No, the Bible goes on and on about literal six days. The word yom, now some people will say yom is a day, and I agree that a yom is a day. Some people will also say that it's an era. Yeah, that's a little bit more iffy there. But you have to look at the contextual clues to give you that idea. And many of those same things will tell talk about a literal six days. They're talking about, a, 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 you know, there is a morning and a night, end of the first day, end of the second day, end of the third day, all the way through here. 
So, but here's the point. If the beginning is wrong, what else is wrong? See, if I throw out pieces of that theory and go, it's all, this part is wrong, then I can go and skip into things that I don't like and, and throw those things out. That's the danger of this thing. And how does death get into the garden? Now, here's the point that you have to see. So God creates Adam and Eve, and he sets up two trees. So this is really, really important part. He sets up the tree of life, and he says, don't eat of that. We'll talk about that in a second. But he sets up the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, if you think about the knowledge of evil, there are two different types of people that look at the knowledge of evil. That's criminals, because they want to understand evil, right? The second group of people happen to be really interesting is police officer types. Now, there's several groups of that, that thing. But those guys are studying evil so that they can catch the guys who are doing evil. They kind of catch that. Now, we can look at that and say, yeah, the, the, looking at the knowledge of evil is a bad thing. But what the Bible is saying, even a deeper level, is the knowledge of good is just as much of a problem. I'm going to flip over to a couple verses here. This is really a powerful one. You can kind of read this with me. And it's in Romans, For I do not understand what I'm doing because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. And if I do what I don't want to do, I agree that the law is good. So now I'm no longer one doing it, but it's the sin living within me. For I know that nothing good lives in me. What? We'll skip over to another verse here. It says, says um, in verse 20, 21, So I discovered this principle. When I want to do what is good, evil is within me. Oh, and yet, that's what man is about. Man wants to do an evil point, and they, and they think that they're doing good, but they're doing evil. What the tree of knowledge of good and evil is trying to give you is this understanding that this tree was about evil that men do and good that men do. But God is saying, I want you to do what I'm telling you to do which is beyond that, is a spiritual law. And you can get lost in these verses here because they're gorgeous verses and they're directly related to this part here. So we'll go back into our little point here. How can you have, if Adam and Eve eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and they have this tree, now they're in sin. And here's the fascinating part. Do you know that that God, the Father, kicks them out of the garden. I always thought that was kind of, like, why do you kick them out of the garden? And then they put a, he puts a sentry on the outside of the gate and doesn't let him back in. But here's what you have to catch. They already were in sin. If they eat of the tree of life, they're going to live forever in their sin. So in the Garden of Eden, which is talking about death and life in here, Here's what you have to understand. If they lived forever, forever in their sin, the Garden of Eden would turn into hell. What? That's exactly what the case is. When you see the power of this point, that's why you can't have death before Jesus comes to create life. The whole point of the Garden of Eden is about choice, that you need to make a choice to do and obey God, or are you going to do your own thing? And if you do your own thing, whether you think it's good or whether you think it's evil, it is all man's choice and man's silliness, in essence. And that is sin. We always want to talk about, you know, fooling, drinking, and, 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 you know, smoking weed or whatever we want to talk about, all the bad fooling around kind of thing. And I'm like, okay, it gets you. But you know what, what real sin is? Is unfaith. When you don't operate in faith and you think that you can do it yourself, that's the problem. That's exactly what Adam and Eve both 
did. They operated in what they wanted to believe and they operated within that. So they did what they thought was good based upon what, this, what Satan was telling them. And you see why the evolution story can't live within that. We can't have those two theories going together and melding together. On our next slide. So the purpose of, if we have death before sin, we have to redo perfection over again. Wait, did he mess up? God didn't mess up. The literal six days is a faith issue. Hey man, if you have faith that Jesus died and rose from the grave, which we have scant historical evidence, and we actually have the same problem in the creation story. We have scant historical other kind of reference points that we can look at. And as I shared with you before, the Creation Institute, you know, creationtoday.org, Jeff Swanson's ministry, those guys talk about some of those evidences, okay? But there are arguments back and forth. But what I'm doing is I'm trusting in my God who wrote the thing he was there. The second law of thermodynamics is a really powerful law. Now, I'm going to give you the stripped down version, but basically it goes, we go from order to chaos, right? When I'm young, I got strong back, strong knees, I'm not fat, all this other stuff that I have to deal with and hair and da 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 like hearing loss and all these other things, right? But as I grow older, things start to fall apart. But evolution theory actually violates that. It says that you go from, from chaos to order. We go from nothingness and things all floating everywhere, and then somehow they get into an orderly fashion. It violates that law. And that is a law that we all have known about. Everything goes. I mean, if I buy a new car today, if I still have it 20 years from now, that thing ain't any good anymore. It might be a great car in some ways, but I'm going to have to do a lot of repairs to keep that thing going because it goes from order to chaos. The Garden of Eden is about choice. That's the whole point of this thing, okay? So the choices are mine. I must accept my choices and must abide by the rules. And here's the thing. If I do that, if I think that I can abide by the rules by my own power, the answer is I can't. And that's the whole reason for needing a Savior. What God was trying to do is saying, you know, I set up everything perfect. Adam and Eve, which is in essence you and I, they were real people, but, they were, but it's the same choice that each one of us have. At the point of accountability, they made a choice to go against them. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So if we all make, a, all make this choice, we all need a Savior. It doesn't matter how little or how big it is. And life is outside of me. I mean, there's more stuff that can affect me in this way. So I'm just, and I know you're saying, but give me all the evidences. Man, that's why I'm telling you, send, sending them off to those other groups, okay? So I want you to think about what worldview that you look at. If you believe in old earth and an evolutional kind of viewpoint, you say that Genesis is not, is not true, but what else in the Bible is not true at that point? Or, if you believe in a young earth, which is what the Bible says, and a Christian worldview, then you're holding and you're embracing what the Bible says and the Word of God. But let me throw out a scripture to you that will mess you up, because this has everything to do with creation. It's Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth will pass away. That means everything is going to die. Everything in our heavens and our earth are going to pass away, but my word will never pass away. In Revelation 21, the, after the tribulation, after the millennial reign of Christ, after the white throne judgment, here's what happens. Whoosh, there's a fire, it burns everything up. And a new heaven and a new earth comes down. And people go, 
I get the new earth, I mean the new earth because we have a sinful world and we have sin upon it, but there's actually also a new heaven. Let me give you two reasons why there's new heaven, and it's easy to catch it in the very first book that was ever written is the book of Job. Job's on the planet. And then Satan kind of goes, is walking to and fro along the planet. And then he somehow gets up to the throne room of God. And he's talking. And they're talking about, have you considered my servant Job? It's like, dude, he'd, he would, he'd curse you if you took away some of the blessings in there. They're standing in this, this time frame. In the New Testament, it shares over and over again that Satan is accusing the saints. Who is he accusing it to? To the Father. He's on the throne. Jesus is sitting on the throne with God the Father. So the only access point that he has is right to the end of the throne. That means accusations are happening against us which are sinful. Now, in the middle of the tribulation, one of the most powerful points that it says, and it's in Revelation 12, it says, Woe to you, earth! The devil has come down with great wrath, knowing that his time is short. And when we understand that point there, you have to destroy the heaven and the earth, because there's sin in both of them. That's why it was perfection, created in perfection, and by man's choice, it created the chaos. It went from order to chaos, which is the exact theory and understanding of the second law of, of thermodynamics. And when we understand it went that way, based upon an understanding of a law of, uh, that we actually observe, then we know it's true. So what are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the world, world view of that? Or are you going to believe the God view? That's your choice. So if you'd like to leave comments down below, happy to answer them. I'm not going to be able to answer all of the scientific questions because I really don't want to get into that. I focus on more of the, the philosophical points here. Again, creationtoday.org, uh, the Creation Institute, uh, Jeff Swanson on the Plan Bible, those guys actually do a really great job of giving you some of the scientific clues. But what I want to do is the global uh, um, understanding in here. So this is the fifth part of our series, and watch the next one coming later on. <music>